Welcome, everyone, to a conversation that I, Brian McCall from Catholic Family News, I'm going to have with uh, Chris Ferrara, uh, author, lawyer, and uh, all around great traditional Catholic. <laughs> How are you today, Chris? Well, I'm fine, Brian. Uh, you know, I'm, I might be an author. Let's not talk about how great a Catholic I am because <laughs> my wife far outshines me, <laughs> among many other people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are here today, and, and we have to laugh a bit, or, or, or we might cry, but we're here to talk about uh, the apostolic letter, Moto Proprio, that was uh, issued uh, today by Francis, Traditiones Custodes. Uh, which... <laughs> the, the title is a joke. The uh, title is a joke. Well, I think Guardian, it's the... Guardians of Tradition. I think it's more the prison guards of tradition yeah. is what it should be titled, but was released today. Uh, now, I did, for those of you who may have uh, seen the videos of the Roman Forum, I had predicted that this was going to come out on July 7th, so I obviously was wrong on that prediction, although I was close because it's 0716, so 1 plus 6 is 7, so uh, <laughs> I think I was close to to the prediction, uh, but a real bombshell, I think a Hiroshima uh, explosion in the uh, liturgical life of the church um, that is really the antimatter of Samorum Pontifica, if we could say. So, uh, Chris, why don't you start us off and just say a little bit about what this thing purports to do? Well, it's clear that he is doing what we thought no pope would dare to do in so many words. He's abrogating in the Western church, which comprises more than 90% of the faithful, something no pope had dared to do, something which really cannot be done, but he thinks he's doing it. Mm -hmm. So here's what he says in Article 1. And it's really, it, it would be amusing if it weren't also so devastating in its potential consequences. Article 1 of this document, again, laughably entitled, The Guardians or Custodians of Tradition, announces the destruction of tradition. So Article 1 says, the liturgical books promulgated by St. Paul VI and St. John Paul II in conformity with the decrees of Vatican Council II, that's a lie, that means Vatican Council II never mandated the kind of mass we see today, are the unique expression of the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite. In other words, there's only one mass in the Roman Rite which comprises the Roman Rite in its entirety, the 60-year-old mass devised by the Concilium uh, under Paul VI which left the Pope himself, Paul VI, weeping in the Vatican halls because of the consequences of this. So he's basically said that the traditional Latin mass of more than 1,000 years standing with a canon that is arguably of apostolic origin is no longer part of the Roman Rite. He just wrote it out of the Roman Rite with one sentence. So what status does the traditional received and approved rite of mass in the church, the mass of the saints, the mass of the centuries, what status does it have now? He puts it into some kind of limbo where it just sort of kind of hangs around until he can find a way to get rid of it. The hubris involved in this decision that this Pope thinks that the church is his possession, that the liturgy is his possession, and he can do away with any portion of it is just staggering. It, it can't have any real effect because it so obviously exceeds the power of the papacy uh, the, the limits of the papal authority, as Benedict the, the, the 16th said himself uh, in promulgating Samorum Pontificum, what was sacred then must remain sacred for us. Not according to this fellow. In fact, the opposite. What was sacred then must be cast aside by us. It's really, is well, really. What, now, what, what is the rationale for this insane decision? And we'll get into the details of, of yeah. the implementation. The rationale is basically. Again, this is absolutely ludicrous, guilt by association with unnamed people that say bad things, according to Francis, that annoy him, people who, according to him, reject the council, whatever that means, and people who speak of the true church as if the church over which he presides is not the true church. Uh, and various comments of, of, among people who attend the Latin Mass, which annoy him. So because these bad people say bad things and they happen to attend the Latin Mass, well, away with that Mass. We'll find a way to cabinet outside of parishes. It's one of the details we'll get into. And we'll inhibit and render impossible any growth in the Latin Mass revival movement. Now, there's an obvious objection to this. What about the people who attend the new liturgy? 
They're espousing heresy. <laughs> They're getting elected to public office while subsidizing the mass murder of the innocent. They're engaging in homosexual perversion and promoting it throughout the church. They're engaging in financial corruption. They're dissenting openly, flagrantly from any doctrine or dogma of the church with which they disagree. And they all attend the new mass. So obviously we must do something about this new mass. The only problem he sees in the church is a departure from the status quo of the great renewal of disastrous reforms. Doesn't care about doctrine, dogma, heresy, homosexual corruption, financial corruption, the total decomposition of the church in the Novus Ordo milieu. None of that bothers him. None of it he associates with the new liturgy. But because six and a half people somewhere reject the council, he wants to abolish the received and approved mass of right in the church, at least to the extent of saying it's not the Roman right anymore. I mean, I'm, mm. I'm almost at a loss for words, but we can't be at a loss for words because we're having a, a, a podcast here. Right, exactly. So, <laughs> it, would be, it would be a boring podcast it, without words. It's, it, it's preposterous. It's utterly yes. preposterous. But, it, you yes. know, others have said that this is inadvertently a good development because now he's put his cards on the table. The line is clearly drawn. He's basically saying, I intend to abolish the Latin liturgical tradition in any way that I can. And step one in Article 1 is to say, it's not the Roman right or even part of the Roman right anymore because I say so. Yeah. No, in a certain sense, I think it is good <laughs> in the sense that it's not like a Morris Letizia where he put out some ambiguities. He said how wonderful marriage is, how great, and then seeded it with these footnotes and ambiguities that you know people right. who had eyes to see said, whoa, this, there's a big problem here, but people could deny it. They could go around hand-wringing and justify and contort words, and well, he's not really saying that, and I'll be honest, I was afraid that's what he was going to do. He was going to say, we love some more pontificum, wonderful Benedict, we want to promote some more pontificum more by doing the following things, which would sort of essentially plant mines underneath it. But again, here, at least his cards, as you say, are on the table. I mean, he, he's declared openly declared war on the traditional mass and says, OK, maybe in some places it'll take longer than others in due time. But everybody's going to get on board uh, with the Hannibal Bignini boat. And that's going to be the only the only one to sail it, essentially. And he has enumerated a number of norms uh, after uh, after abolishing the participation of the received and approved rite of mass, the mass of the ages, mm -hmm. in the Roman rite, writing it out of the Roman rite, putting it into limbo. Again, this is preposterous. He then lays down a number of norms for the implementation of his insane designs. So he says, first of all, in Article 2, well, the diocesan bishop calls the shots on the liturgy. He must regulate liturgical celebrations. But then he says to the bishops, you who are the ones to regulate the liturgical celebrations because you are the promoters of unity in your diocese, you must regulate them according to what I say. And now you will do what I say. Right. And he enumerates in the subsequent articles uh, what happens. So he says, uh, if there are one or more groups in your diocese, this is Article 3, that are celebrating mass and assisting at mass according to the traditional Roman rite, here's what you have to do. First, you have to determine whether they accept the legitimacy and validity of the liturgical reform. So I guess he has to conduct some kind of ideological litmus test of entire congregations to make sure that they adhere to the idea that the legitimacy and validity of the mass of Paul VI cannot be questioned in any way, shape, or form, even though the Pope uh, before him did precisely that as Cardinal Ratzinger, right. <laughs> when he said that the introduction of the new missile was a rupture in the history of the liturgy, whose consequences could only be tragic. And when he wrote the French language edition to the reform of the Roman liturgy by Klaus Gamber, in which the future Pope said that uh, uh, what we have is a banal on the spot product. And further, Gamber himself in that book says that the result of the introduction of this new missile was, and I quote him, the real destruction of the Roman right. So mm. apparently the future Pope and Klaus Gamber, one of the most em eminent liturgists of our lifetimes are part of this group that would fail the ideological litmus test and could not be allowed <laughs> to have access to the traditional mass. 
So that, that's the first thing. Next thing, Article 2 of the... Well, again, I want to emphasize that. What is he doing? He's basically setting up for the bishops to get their, you know, secret police to go out right. and start investigating everybody. You might be, you know, you might be an enemy of the people. And we need exactly. to... We, exactly. And, and you know, like you said, administer oaths of fidelity and, and whatever kind of litmus test to... It's again very unclear. You know what is it? What is it they're they're you know supposed to be accused of? Just like socialists, it's very vague, very unclear. But whatever that's vague and unclear, you've got to agree with it. Uh, yeah, and, and the provision is is uh, impossible to uh, interpret yes. in any coherent way. Uh, groups who deny the validity and the legitimacy of the liturgical reform. What is the liturgical reform? Is it right. the typical edition of the Missal in Latin, celebrated with the Roman canon facing the altar? With the traditional rubrics with altar boys and Gregorian chant like we see at the Brompton Oratory? Or is it any and all iterations of the new mass and any and all vernacular translation, translations with any and all innovations such that when you watch the thing, it becomes an appalling spectacle? What does he mean by the liturgical reform? We have no idea. And that's right. the way he wants it. Then in Article 3, he sets forth all these specific things that the bishops who have charge of the liturgy must do, according to Francis, who really is in charge here, not the bishop. Right. So they have to conduct the ideological litmus test. The next provision is they have to designate one or more locations where faithful adherents of these groups may gather for the Eucharistic celebration. In other words, you have to set up little corrals for these unfortunate people. Which but can't not be, parish, yeah, it can't be parish churches. <laughs> it says not, however, the parochial churches. Right. Get the Latin mass out of the parishes. That's command number two. Command number three, establish at the liturgical, at the designated locations, the little concentration camps he wants to be set up, the days on which the Eucharistic celebrations are permitted, according to the Missal. So he's inviting the bishops to say, you can't just have mass celebrated there, only on certain days. So maybe one day a month, one Sunday a month, or the every, every other Saturday, or every other Tuesday, at the chapel in the mausoleum at the local <laughs> cemetery. It could be any place and at any time. And this is what he's inviting, obviously, the hostile bishops to do immediately. And some yes. of them at least will do it. Next. Again, of, if you can pause on that, yeah. the Pope is saying you can't have a Catholic mass that's been around for 2,000 years in a church. I mean, think yeah. about the insanity of that, that statement. At least not in a parish church. You can have not in a little, parish church. Yeah, you can, you can have your buildings and call them chapels, I guess. Uh, but to designate one or more locations. Now that has already been done in most dioceses where the Latin mass is, is returning, and in, mo in most of those dioceses, there's at least one mass at a parish church, and there are also fully erected parishes of the priestly fraternity, and there are oratories and other places where it's said. So why is he saying designate again? Is he saying there should be a new designation now? You have to find new places to put these people mm -hmm. who say bad things that I don't like uh, after they've been expelled from the, the parishes and the other existing locations. Or is he saying that the, the existing locations are fine, except that now the parish ones are forbidden? I don't know. That well, and, and, and he's got his eye on those already designated places already, because later right. on he says, take care not to authorize any of them. And by the way, you need to check them out to make to determine, quote, whether or not to retain them. Right. And then he says, appoint a priest. This is the direction to the bishop. As delegate of the bishop, who is entrusted with these celebrations. What, all of them? Right. You have dioceses where there are Latin masses all over the place. So now we're going to have one priest, a priest, to uh, 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 preside over these celebrations. He is entrusted with these celebrations with the pastoral care of these groups of the faithful. So now we have what, a, a clerical overseer <laughs> of all of the Latin masses in any diocese in the world, including those of the priestly fraternity. They have to respond to some priest appointed by the bishop who is now their overseer. That's the, that's the next norm. And then the fifth norm, to proceed to verify that the parishes already erected for the benefit of these faithful are effective for their spiritual growth and to determine whether or not to retain them. So I go to a, a fraternity of St. Peter Parish in an undisclosed location, and that is a fully erected parish. So now the bishop's being invited to reconsider whether they should continue as fully erected parishes. But there must be no new groups. That's the next norm. 
take care not to authorize the establishment of new groups. So what's going on here is he wants to choke off any avenue for a growth of the Latin mass revival movement. That's, that's the intent here, and it's pretty obvious. And then he says, priests ordained after today, which is the date this thing was published, must submit a formal request to say the Latin mass. In other words, he guts some more in pontificum, which says any priest is free to celebrate his private masses according to either the new missal or the traditional missal, and the faithful could attend those celebrations. Mm. That's gone. He's abolished that. And then he says, priests who are already... Well, celebrate. and actually that one is even worse because it's he kind of gives with one hand to the bishop and then takes away because then he says, and the bishop can't grant that permission to the newly ordained priest without consulting with the apostolic see. Yeah. So you so got to come back is, to me. <laughs> yeah, so, the, so the idea is none of the priests now in training or about to be ordained, will be able to celebrate the traditional mass because mm -hmm. permission will be denied, if not by the hostile bishop, then by Rome in cons consultation with the bishop. Or, so, or they'll just never respond and lose it in the drawer with the petition of the Council Fathers to condemn communism. Yeah, another indication that he intends to yes. stamp out yes. any attempt to expand the scope yes. of, the, of the Latin mass revival. And so no new groups. And priests ordained after today uh, need formal permission, which they probably won't get in many cases. And those who already celebrate, this is the next norm, priests who already celebrate should request from the diocesan bishop the authorization to continue to enjoy this faculty. In other words, you have to get re-upped again by the bishop. And the bishop, who is probably hostile in many cases, is just being encouraged to say no here. So yes. further, further cutting off an avenue for, for the growth of the Latin mass revival movement. Now, here's another really disturbing provision, Article 6. All of the institutes of consecrated life and societies of apostolic life, including the fraternity, which celebrate according to the traditional missal, uh, are, are now under the jurisdiction of the Congregation for the Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies for Apostolic Life. That's the same Vatican Department that destroyed the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate. So now uh, potentially what could happen here is they'll send commissioners out to these societies and other Latin mass communities to investigate them. And since they're, they're under this institute, this uh, dicastery's jurisdiction, you could have directions such as offer communion in the hand, use the readings of the new lectionary. Potentially it could be anything coming from this Vatican dicastery. Which, and in fact, he's, he's already started, told them that's what he wants to do, because earlier on he said, uh, you have to use the vernacular readings. Yes, and then he adds an yeah. additional jurisdictional overseer, yes. the Congregation for Divine Worship, together with the Department or the, the, uh, the Congregation for Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life. These two Vatican departments will uh, oversee the enforcement of this motu proprio, and also the existence of the Latin mass movement in general, wherever it happens to be, to ensure, obviously, that it stops growing. That's the intent here. No new growth, no new priests will be allowed to celebrate it unless they manage to get permission from both the bishop and the Vatican. No new groups can be erected. No new parishes can be erected. And even the ones that exist, they have to uh, reapply, apparently, for permission to continue in their existence. So that pretty much exhausts the motu proprio itself. But to summarize, the idea behind this motu proprio is the traditional Latin mass is no longer part of the Roman rite, ridiculous. And wherever the tradi traditional Latin mass is being celebrated, that's it. No further expansion, no further gro growth, no new groups, and a limitation of even the ones that exist with specified days, specified locations, and no more parish masses. So the idea is to basically snuff out the traditional Roman rite. And when you, when you go to the accompanying letter, there's absolutely no doubt that that is his intention. So here's what he says in the accompanying letter. It is up to you, the bishops, to authorize in your churches as local ordinaries, the use of the Missalai Romanum of 1962, so far so good, Applying the norms of the present motu proprio, which we've just discussed, which basically snuff out the growth of the movement, 
It is up to you to proceed, listen carefully, in such a way as to return to a uniform, a unitary form of celebration and to determine case by case the reality of the groups which celebrate with this Missalai Romanum. So he wants everyone eventually to be celebrating and assisting at mass only according to the Missal of Paul VI. Well, and the irony of that, according to a unitary form, if anyone has ever been to a new mass, there's nothing uni uniform about it. You go from one church to the next and you'll see something completely different. So the irony is we want this mass that's going to give us unity, but it's actually the most disunified form of lit liturgical worship ever. Yes. And, uh, you know, leave me absolutely no doubt of the matter, he says in the very next paragraph, indications about how to proceed in your diocese are chiefly dictated by two principles. And here he drives the nail hmm. into the coffin. On the one hand, to provide for the good of those who are rooted in the previous form of celebration and need to return in due time to the Roman rite promulgated by Saints Paul VI and John Paul II. That's the first principle. Hmm. This whole operation is designed to do away with the traditional mass and bring people back into conformity with his wishes. And his wishes are simply that there's only one mass, the 60 year old rite of mass invented by Anabali Bugnini, a suspected Mason who was sacked and sent off to Iran by Paul VI, who realized he had been mulcted or defrauded and was reduced to weeping when he realized what had happened. This is the mass that's not going to be the universal norm of the church. That's the first principle. Second principle, uh, on the other hand, to discontinue the erection of new personal parishes tied more to the desire and wishes of individual priests than to the real need of the holy people of God. Yes, the holy people of God who vote for Joe Biden, who by and large have the same opinions about abortion, contraception, divorce and remarriage as liberal Protestants the holy people of God. And again, these are the ones who go to the new mass with, with which he makes no association whatsoever between the rise of disobedience, heresy, uh, silent apostasy, as John Paul II called it, the loss of the populations of Europe, which are being depopulated because they're being contracepted out of existence. None of this troubles him, even though it arises precisely in the milieu of this creation this liturgical creation, which is like a hydra headed monster now, a thousand different variations of it, that's only 60 years old. The arrogance and the unprecedented nature of this, what can one say about it? It's, it's absolutely, it's apocalyptic. It's absolutely apocalyptic yes. that a pope would consider himself entitled to act in this way. Which now, again, to maybe turn to bishops even and priests and faithful who, who are sort of struggling to deal with this. Um, you know, the temptation of many when, when Paul VI, in, in, in not such a harsh way as this even, tried to impose the new mass was a lot of people thought, well, I don't like it. I just have to go along with it because the law is a law. You know, we just have to obey. Uh, you know, what do we say to, to people who, who are tempted to that? Just, oh, well, I love the Latin mass. It was great, but I just got to just I have to obey now. Well, what we can say to them is what, was, what Cardinal Ratzinger said, that the new liturgy is problematic because if we do not see the substance of the faith in the liturgy, where can we find it? Mm. And obviously the substance of the faith is no longer seen in too many places because of the new liturgy and people have lost the substance of the faith. They don't believe. They don't believe in the real presence. They don't follow the teachings of the church on basic moral issues. They're thoroughly liberalized and Protestantized all on account of not just the new mass, but the attitude that accompanies it. Mm. That this is a new day for the church. As, as Cardinal Ratzinger said, Vatican II was the zero hour. Mm. Everything we had done wrong before, including the traditional mass, well, now we'll get it right, beginning with the zero hour of 1965, the final year of the council. And I should, ha I should have mentioned in discussing this explanatory letter that this pope really thinks that he has actually abrogated the traditional Latin mass. Listen to this. Responding to your request, I take the firm decision to abrogate all the norms, instructions, permissions, and customs, customs meaning the customary right of mass, mm -hmm. 
that, that, that precede the present motu proprio and declare that the liturgical books promulgated by the saintly pontiffs, Paul VI and John Paul II, in conformity with the decrees of Vatican II, constitute the unique expression of the Lex Orandi of the Roman Rite. Repeating this idea that the Roman Rite no longer includes the traditional Roman Rite, it's gone. But then, listen to this, I take comfort in this decision from the fact that after the Council of Trent, St. Pius V also abrogated all the rites that could not claim a proven antiquity, establishing for the whole Latin church a single Missalai Romanum. So he thinks, or expects us to believe anyway, that he, like Pius V, is abrogating the traditional Latin mass while ignoring the fact that Pius V abrogated only other rites of mass that were of less than 200 years standing. So he's turning the teaching uh, and the will of Pius V <laughs> on its head to say that a 60 year old mass is now being made the universal norm of the church and that the right that does have a claim to antiquity, the only right is the it's one that's being abolished. The right. diabolical inversion and he, he says this rhetorically with a straight face. It's yes. ludicrous. Well, well, on top of the fact, his, his next statement is totally false, where he says when Pius the, the fifth got rid of the no, new rights, to go back to the old, he established a single uh, right, which he did it. Because by allowing these ancient rights, up until 1962, if you went to a Latin rite in the Western church, most people did go to the, Ro the, the Roman rite that we're familiar with. But he allowed the Dominican Latin Mass to continue, the Ambrosian, so the and the the rite of Sarum, which was used in England. So even his statement that well, Pius V got rid of everything but this one missile is absolutely not, you know, not even the case. He he certainly allowed and again, you know, rites that had been around uh, for a significant amount of time. So as you said, it's just a diabolical inversion. It's just. It reminds me of George Orwell, 1984, where, well, history is actually not agreeing with us, so we'll just rewrite history and change it. Along, to talk about Orwell, the title, <laughs> Guardians of Tradition. Yes. The anatomy of tradition. Yes. But let, let's yes. just emphasize that point. What he's saying is that following the example of Pius V, he is going to abrogate the ancient right in favor of a 60-year-old right. Yes. Which is precisely the opposite of what Pius V did. Yeah. He made universal the ancient rite and abrogated only relatively recent rites of less than 200 years standing, all of which, by the way, were basically variations on the Roman Missal anyway. Right. Just some local adaptations, some of which were abuses, but they were all patterned on that one Missal. So when he promulgated the Roman Missal uh, in, in quo primum as the universal norm, it already was pretty much the universal norm except for the local variations, which all follow the basic pattern of that missile. So this is absolute, This is absolutely fraudulent. Uh, Quo primum is the document we're talking about that supposedly you know, Francis claims he's imitating. Uh, but quo primum said, you know, in eternity, if for all time, uh, every priest has a right to say the mass that he promulgated. And then the highlighted language I have down here says, therefore, no one whosoever is permitted to alter this uh, notice of our permission, statute, ordinance, command, precept, grant, indult, declaration, will, decree, and prohibition. Would anyone, however, presume to commit such an act? He should know that he will incur the wrath of Almighty God and of the blessed apostles, Peter and Paul. So it's not Chris and me telling you that he couldn't do this. It's St. Pius V right there in black and white telling you no one has a right to do this. And now, if, they do, if, they, if, if they attempt to, they incur the wrath of Peter and Paul. Now, e even if you put aside for the moment the argument about whether yeah. a future pope could rescind that bull, right. let's assume for sake of argument that a, a successor would have the authority to undo what his predecessor did. The issue here is the absolute fraudulence, the deceptiveness of yes. saying that he is imitating and following the yes. example of Pope St. Pius V by doing precisly the opposite, opposite. of what St. Yes. Pius V did. I mean, yes. how? This is just, it's, it's shoddy. 
It's insulting to the intelligence of the faithful. It's something we have never seen in the annals of the papacy. This whole operation is something we have never seen in the annals of the papacy. But as we suggested at the beginning, this may end up being a good thing because now the battle lines are drawn. He has declared war on liturgical tradition. He has clearly exceeded the authority of the Pope. He has made a mockery of his predecessors, ridiculing their efforts, John Paul II and Benedict XVI alike, okay. to- Including one predecessor. Including one predecessor. predecessor. Still, that in itself is absolutely yeah. staggering. He is revoking all the measures for the restoration of liturgical sanity of his immediate predecessor, while his immediate predecessor is still alive. <laughs> Yes. I mean, if you wrote a novel, uh, some kind of a novel about a drama within the church uh, along the lines of uh, Dan Brown's work, and this was the plot, you would laugh at it. Yes. You would laugh at it. What, yes. what kind of a pope would act this way? A certain reputable Catholic organization, by the way, which I will not mention by name, was assuring everyone only days ago that, of course, Francis would never do anything like this. He would never just abolish everything his predecessors one of whom was a saint, John Paul II, had laid down. He would never say that the Latin mass no longer belongs to the Roman rite. All oh, these are just rumors. Rest assured, Francis would never do anything of the kind. And now he's done that with unprecedented brutality and with, with an outrageous insinuation that the people who are trying to keep the faith, part of which is the traditional Roman rite, which reflects the faith they're trying to keep, these are all just bad people who say bad things, and we must punish these bad people by treating them like pariahs until they go away. That's the level on which yes. this, this document operates. No, to get back to 1984 until they go away or just are so beaten into submission that they come to love Big Brother, right? Yeah, well, I mean, yes. what more can we say about this by way of our, our initial impressions? Um, you know, I, 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 th I think that's enough to give people an orientation, but yes. I don't think there's anybody, anybody in the neo-Catholic camp that's going to be able to put a positive spin on this. But the good, there, is good, there is good news, though. There's good news. I'm hearing that a lot of the bishops who have been very favorable to the traditional mass, seeing the benefits that accrue spiritually, uh, also in respect for the bishop's own authority from faithful who are so grateful to the bishop and even financially because these Latin mass centers are cash cows for many dioceses. <laughs> Seeing all of this since 2007, a lot of these bishops have totally changed their thinking. And it seems to me that a significant number of them will have the following attitude toward this document. Basically, yeah, no, we're not, we're not doing that. Right. They're too happy with the arrangement that they have forged with both diocesan priests and institutes and societies like the fraternity and as part of this Latin mass revival movement. They like what they see. Their thinking has been changed. And what they see from the people who go to these masses is not a rejection of ecclesial authority, but boundless gratitude and respect for authority. I mean, how many of these bishops have presided over some of these celebrations to, to the praise, even the adulation of the faithful, who are so happy to see a shepherd that's finally tending to their needs. Meanwhile, in the Novus Ordo, it, it, it's chaos, doctrinal chaos, yes. moral chaos, financial chaos, donations are plummeting, churches are emptying, the seminaries are empty, the convents are empty. Again, none of this he associates with the liturgical reform. So, I mean, it should be obvious, and that's that's what the traditionalist critique has been from the start. Mm. The statement of the obvious. That well, if the, if the seminaries were part over emptying, they're going to get emptier now because all the evidence is the only people entering seminaries are people who want traditional forms. And if you just said, by the way, when you get ordained, you're not going to be able to do it, why would you stay? So, I mean, it seems almost we're trying to empty the few seminarians that are left. Yeah, I think what's going to happen is that there, there's enough porosity in the document. Mm -hmm. There are ways to get around it so that the bishops who are hostile now have a club to beat you over the head with. That's true. Yes. But the bishops who are favorable have many ways that they can just evade this nonsensical mm -hmm. trash is what it is. I'm sorry I'm being so blunt. But <laughs> uh, I mean, really, in 2000 years, no pope has dared to do 
what this pope thinks he can do literally in one sentence article one saying oh by the way that roman right you thought included the ancient mass of all the saints no longer includes that mass sorry i don't think so yeah i mean to be honest it's the definition the classic definition of a tyrant one who does not govern for the common good for his but for his personal whim and that that's that's what we have here it looks like and benedict said it himself he said the pope is not an absolute dictator whose will is law yes he had the responsibility to be what this document ludicrously claims to be a, a statement by the defenders or custodians or guardians of tradition it's a joke yes but it's a diabolical joke that could have terrible consequences but again you know providence is in charge god is in charge the holy ghost is at work in the development of liturgical tradition itself and in the in the ultimate guidance of the church so we may see that this backfires spectacularly on Francis. Sort of like the vaccination campaign. The more the government insists that everybody be injected with this ridiculous vaccine, the more reluctant people become thinking, well, wow, this is quite the hard sell here. There must be something wrong with the product. Mm. Well, I think, as Chris says, not much more we can say about this, this uh, disaster. And uh, we just committed to, to God in prayer and... Uh, see you know what uh, what the fallout will be so thank you for listening into our, our conversation together and uh, uh, um, just as he said I think all we can do is pray and trust oh. in in God's providence don't give up hope keep the faith yes. persevere uh, someone said uh, popes die this pope will die but the mass lives forever yes amen all right you have a good rest of your day Chris take care goodbye